Okay, so interacting with clients. Obviously, this is one of the most important skill sets that you can develop as a lawyer. The relationship between attorney and client is a very interested, interesting dynamic, and there are some things that you can um, work on to make sure that the relationship between the attorney and client ends up with a positive result for both the lawyer and the client after the uh, representation has concluded. Now, some of these tips are going to be applicable to different types of clients. For example, if you uh, represent large businesses, banks, you know, those kind of folks, they, they're usually very familiar with lawyers. They deal with lawyers. They know what to expect. They understand the relationship. And it's a little bit easier uh, when you have a client like that. But if you represent a person or persons, especially if those people have never used a lawyer before, there's some stumbling blocks there that you can kind of preempt if you know what you're doing to make the relationship go a little smoother. So it's a big topic, um, but I just want to give you a couple of pointers that might help you out. First, you have to understand, and maybe you already do understand this, that client perceptions of lawyers is not so good. There was a 2002 ABA study. They wanted to find out how did most people view lawyers. And the second part of the study was when lawyers are discharged for cause, when, when clients fire their lawyers, what is the reason for that? So the first part of the study found that the clients generally found lawyers to be greedy, manipulative, corrupt, that they misrepresent their qualifications, that they overpromise their results, and they're not upfront about their fees. They also found that they charge too much. 69% of those who were asked said that they thought that the lawyer was more interested in his or her own personal interest than those of the clients. When they looked at lawyers that got discharged, because obviously, as an attorney, you can be fired for any reason. Even if you're providing great results, the client always has the right, obviously, to be represented by any lawyer of his or her choice. But when they did this study, and I found this very interesting, when they asked people, why did you terminate your, your attorney? 5% said it was because of the results that they got or did not get. But 67% said it was because they were treated discourteously. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you that clients are more sensitive to how they're being treated by their lawyers than the result. You would think that that would be opposite. We as lawyers probably think that that is, uh, has to be opposite. We would think that, gee, the result that I get for, for you would be the most important thing. But when you ask clients, they don't think that way. So, tip number one, Again, obvious, but very important. Treat your clients courteously. I remember being in a lawyer's office and it was a client that I was co-counsel on and the client was sitting next to me. The lawyer was on the other side and the client said something and the, <laughs> the lawyer looked at him and said, shut up, we don't care what you have to say, we're the lawyers. I was shocked. I don't know how this attorney ever has clients. You know, that's a dramatic example. But if you're not really careful on how you treat your clients, you're going to lose them or they're going to be dissatisfied with your services. And this is important, even if you're providing the best service possible. The other thing that you should be understanding in terms of how you treat your client is try to make it personal. If you're representing private parties, unless, again, unless they've had some experience dealing with lawyers, they're kind of intimidated a little bit. I, you know, I've interviewed thousands of clients over the last 40 years, and a lot of times they'll in the chair and you can see the tension. You know, they're grabbing the chair, they're kind of stiff. I try very hard to just make them relax. Look, I'm, you know, this is what I do for a living, but I'm just a person like you, I'm here to help you. And I would actually see people get more relaxed as I talked. Being personal, a lot of, a lot of 
People are kind of intimidated by lawyers. They look up to lawyers. You gotta try to even that out a little bit. Just talk to them as, as people. The second thing that I would tell you, which is extremely important in your interactions with your client, is you have to maintain client contact. Here's the problem. We provide legal services. You know, we're not giving them a product. They don't have anything to grab onto. And they don't see us most of the time unless you're in a trial or something, they don't see the legal services being maintained. So if they're not hearing from you, they're assuming that you're not working on their case. If you're not remaining in contact with them, and this is important, even if you are working on their case, they assume that you're not because they don't see it happening. One of the things that I've done in my practice, and I know a lot of lawyers do this, is give them paper. Give them everything. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's an email to the court asking for an adjournment. If they're, if they're getting paper in the mail, even if it's not something that you as a lawyer know, my client doesn't really need to know this, give it to them. It, it helps uh, the client get the impression that you're not only working on the case, but you're including them in the process. And number three, in terms of you know, your, your interaction with the client. And this is my pet peeve, return phone calls. For some reason, many lawyers are just not very good at returning phone calls. And again, even if you are working diligently on their case, if you're not returning their phone calls or you're not responding to their emails, they will assume that you're ignoring them and they will assume that you are not working on their case. So even if you are, it can, you can lose a client, you could end up in a grievance. It is, it is unethical to not respond to your client. And that means even if you don't have anything to tell them. Let's say you're working on a case and it's been a couple of weeks and you know, this happens, you know, you have a lot of cases, your adversary has a lot of cases and not much has changed in the last time your client contacted you and now you get this email, what's happening with my case? The temptation, I think, is to say, look, I don't need to respond to this email. I talked to her three weeks ago. We're no farther ahead than we were then. Well, the client doesn't know that. Even a quick response to say, you know, we're, we're, we're diligently working in your case, but you know, we haven't moved the ball forward in terms of negotiation. Just getting that email back from you lets your client know he's working on the case. She's responding to my emails. It's a comfort thing, and it's a good way to keep clients. Even if you're in trial, and trial lawyers know this, that when you're in trial, everything else kind of just gets blanked out. You're focused on that trial. So you're gonna get phone calls and emails from your clients while you're in trial. You obviously can't return those phone calls. Have your staff do it. Have your staff call the client back or respond to the email. You know, Mr. Selbach is in trial right now. The trial will probably be going on for the next seven days. It's very difficult for him to, to get back to you, but we wanted to know that we did get your phone call or we did get your email or we did get your voicemail. And Mr. Salbach wanted me to let you know that he's, you know, he's not able to work on it right now, but he will, when this trial is over, get right back to it. No client is gonna have a problem with that, but they will have a problem if you don't respond and your thought process that, well, I can't possibly return this call because I'm in trial. Well, we know that, but the client doesn't. Lastly, it's very important to maintain client expectations because when you go into a case, your expectations of what's gonna happen and your client's expectation of what's gonna happen is probably not the same and sometimes it's really far. And you have to nip that in the bud at the very beginning, which means you have to have realistic goals about the case. Now, your client might share your realistic goals with you, that's fine, but your client might have some very unrealistic and unaccomplishable goals. You have to have that conversation with your client at the beginning of the representation. You sit down and not only do you tell your client, this is what, what I think we can accomplish here, these are the challenges that I see in our case, and these are the goals that I think we can reach. But you also ask your client, and this is the way I phrase it is, what does victory look like to you? 
What, what, do you, what are your expectations here? Now, a lot of times those expectations will come in and you'll say, yeah, I think, I think we're on the same page here. You know, I think that that's a realistic goal of what we can actually accomplish in this case. But sometimes you'll hear what they say and they're like way, way unrealistic. And you have to now bring them back. You have to explain why that's probably not accomplishable in this case. One of the things that I think um, is a good rule of thumb is under promise, but over produce. Okay, so when your client is, even if you have a good case, and this is the temptation on a good case, if you have a good case, you might be discussing that case with your partner or another lawyer, and they'll say, wow, this is, this is really a good case. You have to not have that same uh, enthusiasm with your client because should you not attain what you expected in the beginning and what you communicated to your client your client is going to be very very disappointed but if you under promise I don't mean be dishonest but but keep those expectations low and then you overproduce you look like a hero but if you over promise even if you then reach that goal, your client will say, well, that's, you know, that's what we were expecting to happen. So overpromise, but overproduce. One of the questions that, if, especially if you're a litigator, comes up is, what is my case worth? The, there's only one answer to that. There's no way to tell at this point what your case is worth. Especially if you're talking about a jury trial. If a lawyer tells you, yeah, your case is worth this much, Either that lawyer has no experience with juries or that, tr that lawyer is not being truthful. Because juries, it's, it's a lottery. It's, it's Las Vegas. You have no idea. You never answer that question. If you put, and they'll, and they'll pr possess, well, well what, do you, what do you think? Is it more than 100, less than 100? Be very careful. You, it's a lose-lose for everybody. If you put a number on that case, even if you hit it, you were supposed to hit it. If you don't hit it, then you didn't do your job. So protect yourself. And lastly, uh, the so-called slam dunk case. And sometimes we have cases as lawyers, and maybe they are slam dunk, or we look at them, we say, you know, I, I, there's no way I can lose this case. Although I've been doing this too long. When you think that, usually you can lose it. Never, ever communicate to your client, hey, we got a slam dunk case here. So here are, those are some of the tips that I would suggest that you keep in mind as you're developing your skill set in dealing with your clients.